Hello, everyone, and welcome to the forefront of healthcare innovation. In an era where artificial intelligence reigns supreme, I welcome you to join us on a journey to uncover its impact in healthcare. This is the Future of AI and Health podcast series that we're doing in collaboration with Healthline Media and Outcomes Rocket. I'm your host, Saul Marquez, and I'll be doing this series together with the outstanding Dr. Jenny Yu, Chief Health Officer at Healthline Media. We're excited to give you this series to help you illuminate the path forward on what AI means to healthcare today and in the future. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Outcomes Rocket here with the Future of AI and Health series with Healthline Media. I'm here with my co-host, Jenny Yu. Hey Saul, it's good to be back together. It's such a pleasure to have you back here. And today we are hosting an incredible guest. He is no stranger to the podcast and somebody that if you do not know about, you need to know. His name is Bruce Brandis. He is the president at Care AI. He's got over 30 years of experience in, in entrepreneurship, management, and thought leadership in healthcare, serving with companies like Teladoc and Lavango, uh, as well as leadership roles at Avia and Airstrip and many more. He's at the forefront of technology and couldn't think of anybody else more uh, appropriate for this series than Bruce. So, uh, so excited to welcome you to the podcast, Bruce. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure. And uh, Jenny, good to see you. Good to see you. Love it, Bruce. Well, look, uh, let's get this thing started. You know, uh, AI, ambient intelligence, transforming healthcare delivery in hospitals. Can you help us better understand ambient intelligence? Sure. So let's maybe take a step back and, and talk about what are the problems that we need to solve for in healthcare um, with the technology, and then I'll explain it. Um, I think that there are really two common existential threats that every health system faces. And it's not that they don't have a, a laundry list of problems, but specifically, you know, one, what we ask of our bedside caregivers has, has really become humanly impossible. And unfortunately, too much of the technology that we've brought to bear has actually made their lives harder, not easier. Um, and unfortunately, that has led to many caregivers leaving the workforce. And if you just look at the dynamics of our population growth, um, we, we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough um, specialists in many areas, and we're not going to for, for the foreseeable future. And, and then secondly, even if we had all the labor we needed for hospitals, the underlying cost of our current acute and post-acute care models is really fiscally unsustainable. And so what we believe is you can't really just tinker around the edges to solve for those problems. You really need to take a step back and say, in healthcare, how have other industries done this? And that's really where ambient intelligence comes in. Because if you look at um, how many other industries, almost every other industry has transformed themselves, it's this technology that is at the, the root of it. Um, you can look at things like um, if, if you've ever been in an Amazon Go store um, in retail. So when you walk in, uh, you grab an item and you leave because there are advanced sensors and AI that understand who you are, what item you've taken and how you are paying for it. And then subsequently how to decrement the inventory and get it replenished. Similarly, if you think about how a FedEx distribution center works, you know, Boxes are, are whizzing by and the efficiency with which, you know, different packages get to their destination is a reflection of, you know, the, the sensors and AI that understand, um, you know, how that operation works. In healthcare, we actually take our most valuable resources and do the equivalent of uh, make them data entry clerks. Um, and so the concept of bringing ambient intelligence to healthcare to improve the productivity uh, and efficiency of our caregivers um, it really um, is front and center. And, and, and then from a quality and safety standpoint, the other example I like to use on where ambient intelligence um, really plays a big role is if you think about how uh, increasingly autonomous driving cars work, and I'm not just talking about the ones that have no no human being driving. I'm really more talking about the human being who is driving the car, who is now surrounded with a neural network of sensors and AI that is constantly aware of its situation, the, the, you know, the road conditions, the, the, the weather, the, um, the traffic around me to dynamically help uh, make me break, prevent me from drifting out of my lane. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's really about reimagining what is transportation. And so 
um, we are in the process of bringing that same technology that helps keep us safer on the roads and helping us more productive in every other industry and creating a much better, uh, more simple com consumer experience, taking all of that technology and looking at how we do things and have for decades in how we deliver care in hospitals and nursing homes and reimagining what's possible because of this neural network of advanced sensors and AI um, to allow us to look at clinical and operational workflows in a new way and really get at the root of solving problems um, that, uh, frankly, for a very long time, haven't been able to be addressed sufficiently. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, I mean, and you do such a beautiful job of connecting the dots and using, you know, these these examples. Um, it's the technology is here already, and we're just you, you guys are bringing it in, into into healthcare. So I, I love that. Um, and you know, Doctor Yu here with us. I, I saw you shaking your head, right, when you said, yep, you know, making us clerks, you know, maybe you want to share a little bit about your story. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you practice medicine, you certainly see um, the challenges of, um, you know, a uh, shortage of workforces. Um, and then um, the people who then are sort of um, stretched in terms of um, their hours, in terms of their work, um, then have probably a higher tendency to make human errors, right? And then when you have that, whether it's a a nurse, um, even just a sitter, um, you know, in a in a um, you know a patient room situation, whether inpatient or outpatient, um, some of the quality can come down, and um, and you're trying to solve it with, um, you know, from that operations standpoint with more people, um, but that's never going to work well. We've seen that, and so um, love Bruce that you guys are thinking about it from a technology standpoint that might already exist, but how do we bring it to healthcare um, so that it can be successful? So that it can be part of, um, you know, the delivery care that is currently, but imagining it for the future. So, um, on that note, can you highlight just some of the specific success stories um, or use cases in which you're already seeing how this is impacting overall patient outcomes? Yeah. So at the highest level, what we're really trying to do is to build smart hospitals and create smart care teams, similar to how you have a smart home. Um, and so to bring that technology, if you think about in, in a hospital, there, the only information that we really have is information that a human being sees or hears and then takes the time to actually type into an electronic medical record. And much of that is actually retrospective. And so the real concept is how do we use um, sensors to capture a lot more data um, to understand, to be ambiently aware at all times of, of what's going on, looking and listening in a way that's appropriate to capture lots of data that just frankly doesn't exist today. And then to layer in AI to interpret that data and then apply it in an appropriate way, consistent with workflow to help aid the, the human beings delivering care. So with this big aspirational goal of creating smart hospitals, um, there are very specific use cases that people are starting with where there's an immediate ROI um, and given the, the immediate challenges or logical places to start on this broader journey. And I, I'd specifically highlight uh, virtual nursing. Um, and it's really a misnomer to call it virtual nursing because it's really virtual inpatient care. But it's this concept of recognizing that we don't have enough nurses, um, that we need to change the complexion of the care team, that we might have a, an intensivist or a specialist in one hospital that needs to consult on a case in a hospital a hundred miles away, a thousand miles away, you know, so how do we uh, deploy technology, putting uh, a sensor in the room? And I intentionally use the word sensor uh, and not, uh, not a camera, um, although it does have camera capabilities. What we're learning is with virtual nursing, there are two approaches to it. One is to put a camera in the room that you get from Best Buy or put an iPad on a stick and, and uh, use Zoom and, and Teams and say, okay, we're doing virtual nursing and we can do that to help improve admissions and discharges uh, and, and other processes with some a caregiver who's remote. Um, or this, and, but then what ends up happening is virtual nursing becomes just another point solution amid way too many point solutions. And quickly people realize that's really more like back to the car analogy. It's like having a backup camera in a car. It's a nice incremental improvement, but it's not transforming anything. And so the second approach is thinking about virtual nursing as the tip of the spear for something much, much more transformational, um, where that camera in the room is actually a smart sensor that is, um, that has ambient monitoring capabilities to, to be, you know, capturing a lot of the additional data beyond just uh, a video visit, um, and then wrapping that with AI. And, and what we're seeing now is the early returns of people who are approaching virtual nursing in that way. Um, incredible reductions in uh, 
staff set, uh, staff turnover, uh, so improving recruitment and retention, incredible improvements in patient safety um, because of lots of uh, safety catches um, that are able to be made. Um, significant improvement in throughput. Many hospitals have capacity constraints. So a great way to make sure that we're discharging um, people on time and, and being able to free up that bed for the next patient. Um, as, as well as um, patient satisfaction and staff satisfaction um, are, are going off the charts with, with this technology. So those are the, the KPIs and, and metrics. And there's a lot more to unpack beneath that that we probably won't have time to get in today. But um, really very encouraging and transformational stories about the immediate ROI. Um, and then once that sensor is there for that virtual nursing use case, to then to start layering in other use cases around falls prevention and pressure injury prevention and clinical documentation uh, done verbally, staff duress and staff safety. There are a whole lot of other areas um, that that same uh, sensor starts to be able to affect where your ROI uh, and the way in which you deliver care is totally transformed. Yeah, I love that. I can imagine sort of um, that once you have all of that data and in terms of different categories of data that you collect, um, you can realize what are the specific patterns, right, in which you can drive the ROI. And so, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Bruce, a uh, question on how it all works together, right? The health system has a lot of devices. Interoperability is, is, a, is a theme that we will not be able to you know, uh, get things done without addressing. So how does, how does the, the system work with other devices inside of the hospital uh, and things like the EMR? Yeah, that, that's an important question. And I think when we talk about interoperability, what we're really talking about is how do you simplify my workflow? And, and, and in order to do that, you really need to take a look at what's working, what are, what are the capabilities and, and investments that you've made that are foundational, like the EMR, um, like um, the televisions that you have, like your patient entertainment system, like um, the beds that you use, the telemetry devices, the existing nurse call system, to make sure that all of those other capabilities come together because there, there's no reason to rip and replace something that's working. Um, it, it, and especially as you start to think about what are the components that you need to do to make the, the life easier of the bedside nurse. Um, you know, too much of the, as I mentioned earlier, too much of the technology we've brought to bear have made their lives harder, not easier. And all of these individual point solutions um, that we've given them collectively are further fragmenting an already very fragmented caregiver and patient experience. So when we talk about interoperability, it's really about how do we take a, a platform approach to what we're doing and not just perpetuate more point solutions, virtual nursing, virtual sitting, um, falls prevention, hand hygiene compliance as additional point solutions, um, clinical documentation. There are a lot of voice activated clinical documentation systems now, but how do you think about how they all come together? So for us, it's really about looking at the capabilities that we need to bring that will work within that existing ecosystem, all those different components that, uh, that we've described, but at the same time, recognize the pieces that won't work because we've had a lot of clients that have come to us that had a camera in the room uh, and wanted to do these things. And what they've realized is if, if the device itself is not part of an integrated platform uh, where, where the software, the AI, the, the ambient capabilities are not you know, all included into one common platform. Uh, and, and on top of that purpose built for healthcare, um, it's really going to end up becoming a dead end that doesn't uh, affect the outcomes and doesn't provide the ability to scale that, you know, it's one thing to stand up a pilot. It's another thing to actually think about how do you do this across thousands to tens of thousands of, um, of different patient rooms and locations. Um, and then thinking beyond just the four walls of the hospital, be, you know, even beyond that. So it's really important um, when we talk about interoperability um, to make sure that we understand what workflows, what investments um, work today that we need to plug into. And then if, we're, if our ultimate goal is about simplifying workflow, how do we think about the other components that actually need to be added or, or replaced to work within that ecosystem that creates a very simple, safe, uh, and effective uh, you know, new workflow that uh, that ultimately drives uh, better outcomes. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, and you you called it right. The 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 way uh, clinicians are still burned out. I was doing a, an interview uh, last week, and they're telling me it's worse than even after COVID. So it's not getting any better. Uh, these types of solutions are a must. And I love that you and the team are so focused on the clinician and their, and their workflow. So thank, thanks so much for that. 
Yeah. And Bruce, you talked about um, sort of all of the different point solutions, right? So imagining, I, you know, when I um, practiced medicine, there were all these technology innovations that came in. And then it's like a matter of uh, figuring out, hey, how does this actually impact my workflow? And, you know, and the simplification is super important. And that's how you get, I think, the various different folks on the care team within the system to actually want to adopt to it. And that change man- management is really important. And so um, from that st- perspective, do you think that, you know, health systems are ready for the technology, um, whether it's from the care team perspective, right, the nurses, the physicians, um, everybody that's involved? Um, but is it, are people ready for it on the patient side? Do patients feel as well that, you know, that when you have these systems in place um, and you may see, you know, the nurse who's checking upon you a little bit differently um, because of these sensors and technology in place, do you think people are ready to be, um, you know, taking on and adopting to this technology? Yeah, I think there are two ways to think about that. One is we have this technology pervading every other area of our lives beyond healthcare, making my life easier. Um, shoot, I have, you know, Netflix leveraging AI to know what I want to watch better than I know what I want to watch. So you know, we, we see this in, in every other area of our lives. So it actually stands out when I don't have a similar experience in healthcare. And, and it's of utmost importance that we apply this in the appropriate way in healthcare. Um, and so a lot of that is about making sure that the, the healthcare system staff understands how it works so they can reassure patients and that they're not being watched uh, like Big Brother, but you know all these things are appropriate, that their identity is protected so that we're using the right way, uh, the right technologies to view and monitor what's going on in a way that isn't invading their privacy. Um, and, and that's baked into you know, how we've designed and built what we do. But those are common concerns and questions. And you know, we all have, uh, many people have, you know, whether it's Siri or their uh, Alexa device, and I don't want to say it because then she's going to start listening to me. Um, but you know, we're used to having these devices. But in healthcare, we need to make sure that we're putting the appropriate guardrails around um, helping people understand how we're protecting their privacy, but more importantly, why we're doing this because it's really about extending and improving the care delivery and the and the safety and the outcomes uh, and and the experience. I mean, and what we're finding is once people stand up this technology, um, if if both for the nurses, for the other affiliated caregivers, and most importantly, for the patient and their families, they would be very upset if you didn't offer this. Uh, it becomes an expected standard because now I have a caregiver who is available when I need them virtually, that they're ambiently aware of everything that's going on so that they're proactively coming into my room to say, hey, we've noticed that your respiratory rate is declining you know, over time. I was prompted. I want to just drop in and make sure that you're feeling okay. Um, you know, and, and so those types of extra measures to ensure their safety and quality. And, and frankly, when you're ready to go home to make sure that you understand, um, you know, what medications you're supposed to take and, uh, and all the other things that are to come next and not just you understanding, but bringing in my friends and family who are going to be caring for me, uh, when I go home, let them be part of that conversation in the moment to understand what's happening. Um, you know, make sure that if I don't speak English, that I have an interpreter who's part of that conversation. So I clearly understand. So when I go home, I'm on my path to, to health and wellness. Uh, I'm not, you know, likely to have missed something or forgotten something. And so all of this creates a much better consumer experience that leads to them embracing this technology. And, um, and I think in the very near future, expecting it. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, having the clinician buy-in and having the collaboration of the clinician and, um, making sure, like you said, that the care team and the staff um, are the ones delivering sort of the um, importance of these um, technology as being the standard of care um, to the patients. I think we're just at that sort of pivot moment or inflection moment in which um, then this just becomes part of the standard of care. Um, and I love that. Yeah, that's a great, great point there. And and it will stick out if it's not in place, right? I, I just, I think that's so um, spot on. And uh, and and it promising, right? To to be able to look ahead and say, "Wow, we actually have this available, widespread." Um, Bruce, you you've been through, you know, you you've you've had uh, visibility to a lot of different companies and and uh, at the leadership level, um, all forward thinking companies, um, data privacy. You met you you mentioned it some, but can you? comment around AI and, and privacy and, and how 
companies can safeguard against that and what you guys are doing in particular to make sure that, that information is safe? Yeah, well, I, I think, first of all, the concerns about AI that people have um, are valid, but they're also overblown. Um, you know, it's, it's really just the unknown. And this is true not only in healthcare, but it's true in every industry and, and in our personal lives. You know, what, you know, what is, what is AI really going to mean? And I think that there are a couple of ways of, of looking at that. Um, one is we need to think about um, how we're using AI. You know, it, are, is this something that is just a, is a tool to aid uh, the caregiver in, in better decision making? So um, where you have human in the loop, where this is just another tool that I'm getting better information in the moment uh, to be able to make the right decision. But ultimately, the human is making the decision. And that's the vast, vast majority of these clinical workflows, um, you know, how this works. Um, and it's really important, by the way, that the, 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 you know, the large language models and the other data that is informing uh, that is, has, has transparency and, and visibility. I've heard, uh, some of my mentors in the industry describe, you know, we need transparency on, on, you know, what's going into, uh, you know, informing this data. I have more information about what's in my can of soup that I'm about to eat than what's in this, you know, AI model that is advising that I do, you know, this intervention. So it's really important that we get better at, you know, ensuring the quality and, and, and transparency as to how these uh, things are making recommendations when we do have human in the loop. And then the other thing is there are a lot of tasks that, you know, AI can take over where you don't have to have the human in the loop. So you can free up the human beings to, to really focus their time and energy on the things that only human beings can do. And, you know, I, I use examples in the, in the nursing setting. You know, we spend so much time just on regulatory compliance, for example, for leapfrog hand hygiene compliance reporting. You know, that's something that, you know, ambient sensors should be able to capture that someone washed their hands, that we had enough, you know, instances that we can comply with, with that regulatory requirement and that report be automatically uh, created and, and sent off. So no human being has to spend as much time as we are today, you know, doing those, those reports. So, so that's kind of, you know, one way of looking at it. The other is in healthcare, healthcare is different. And, and I mentioned earlier about purpose building you know, these solutions for healthcare and making sure that um, you're intentionally, you know, pursuing SOC 2 certification, high trust certification to make sure all the right internal processes are in place for how you do business, how you build your solutions. Um, you don't get that by buying a camera at Best Buy or, uh, or thinking that, you know, Alexa is going to, you know, be able to address these issues. So there are some heightened measures that need to be taken in healthcare that I think the responsible um, companies that will be around uh, in, in these problems are going to embrace as, as kind of table stakes to ensure that quality and prime and, and safety and quality and, uh, and privacy are protected throughout. Bruce spot on. Thank you so much for that. Um, and, and just a great, great way to think about this, uh, this, uh, you know, thing that a lot of people are thinking about. So, uh, appreciate that. And, and, um, we're here at the end. I, I mean, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, I've really enjoyed this this conversation uh, with you and 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 Jenny. Any any closing thoughts, Bruce, that you want the listeners to to leave with? Yeah, as I think about people and the the hot topic that is AI, specifically AI in healthcare, um, I think we need to be reminded that. Um, Every, there's so much noise today. Every legacy vendor that did this or that is now saying we're an AI company and, and, and we're using AI to do this and that. And the, it's so confusing. And, it, and, um, and a lot of it, frankly, is probably not accurate. Uh, and, and, and so it's kind of a wild, wild west. And I think that with all this ridiculous claims that are being made about AI today uh, that, that uh, may or may not be accurate. I think we're within a very short window where specifically saying, hey, we use AI in how we deliver care or how we uh, bring our product to market or whatever it is, is going to sound just as ridiculous if I were to, let's just say it's in 12 months. If I were to say, oh, we use AI for this and that, it would sound just as foreign and ridiculous it would be if I today were to come to you and say, hey, guess what? You know what we use in our business? We use computers and we use the internet. Of course you do. The question is, what are you doing with it? What problem are you solving? And how are you solving it? What outcomes are you getting? It, it, it's table stakes to say yeah. that we're using AI. It, 
it, the question is, what are you doing with it? Are you doing it in a responsible way? And, and Or are you jumping on the bandwagon and just saying, hey, I see these other companies having success um, because they're using AI in this way. So I'm going to say the same thing. So I think the market uh, has to get smarter about you know, looking behind the claims and, and really understand, have a vision for what is a smart hospital, what is a smart care team, and what's the path that we need to get from where we are to where we want to get to and make sure that you can filter out the noises effectively as possible to get to the future that we all deserve for healthcare. Yeah, Bruce, I, I was thinking the same thing when you were um, talking about AI in terms of, you know, in, the internet, computer. And so um, I can't wait for that story just to get more nuanced um, and that it actually ties to very specific things. Um, so, but that's where we are at the inflection point, right? So. Absolutely. Totally agree, guys. Well, what a, what an incredible discussion. Bruce, thank you. Really appreciate you jumping on the podcast today to share what My you're up pleasure. to. Yeah, uh, awesome just, to be with you guys. Thank you, Saul. It's a big pleasure. And, and uh, it's just, uh, folks, if you want to learn more about what Bruce and the Carry I team are up to, check out the show notes. We'll have a summary of today's discussion and ways to get in touch with him and his team to learn more. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for listening to our series, Future of AI in Health, our collaboration with Healthline Media. As we conclude this episode, we invite you to stay tuned for more insightful discussions on the series that we're doing together. The future is now, and with knowledge comes empowerment. So I want to thank you for joining us and looking forward to having you with us on the next time as we explore the impact of AI in healthcare today and in the future.